and welcome to Career Launch Live. I am your host, Catherine McCord. I am so very excited about today's episode. But before we get started, I just want to say a very special thank you to a wonderful company that I believe in for, and their staff from the bottom of my heart. We are sponsored today by Junco. This is a diversity-based platform where great companies can find diverse talent. Highly, highly recommend. And job seekers hop on there. Companies hop on there. Junco is awesome. I know their people. Highly, highly, highly recommend. So today, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, which is neurodiversity and mental health in the workplace. And to do that, I have a very wonderful human being, Miss Jen Capshaw, join me today. Hi. Good morning. Good to see How you, Catherine. You? It's good to see you too. It is good to see you on this Friday. I needed to see someone whose face I actually like today. <laughs> <laughs> I have thank been thank you for that. <laughs> I have been inundated with insane people this week, and so I was so excited to get to talk to you today. Ah, well, I mean, I don't know if I count as sane, so <laughs> I might be a little leveling up the insanity for you today. But you know what? I like I like your kind of crazy though. It's a good kind of crazy. I think it's a good it's a, it's a good we we like other people, we support other humans kind of crazy. And that I can get behind. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm it's like I always tell people like about it. Yeah, I know. Like animal rescue people uh, are kind of insane. And I tell people like bear with them. Like they, they deal with a lot. They deal with a whole lot. So there are types yeah. of insanity that I, I really welcome. Uh, but it's it's definitely um, it's definitely something that I think this week's been very intense for a lot of people. So it's kind of great, and we're going into mental health uh, awareness month, which is which is kind of cool. Uh, perfect timing for this topic to talk about neurodiversity and mental health in the workplace. So the first thing I want to do real quick is say is define neurodiversity, right? So I always talk about that Judy Singer coined the phrase. Uh, she's a sociologist out of Australia. And basically, it refers to a brain who processes information differently. So think of like ADHD, Tourette's, um, uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia. Oh, gosh, uh, <laughs> bipolar disorder, <laughs> epilepsy, there's a bunch of different things. So what is your definition, though, Jen, of neurodiversity? Um, neurodiversity to me is a diversity of minds and brains in a single group. So um, I like that. And so it hasn't been formally like no one has adopted like formal definitions. And you and I actually use slightly different language. Um, so neurodiversity to me is a mix of neurotypical people and not so neurotypical people together in a group. And I use the term neurodivergent to describe the folks who are not neurotypical. I um, understand that you find that that term to be uh perhaps offensive or inappropriate. So our, not our me. I want to clarify that real quick. Not me, but I have had other people be offended. So that's why I'm careful to use it. But go ahead. Proceed. Sorry. Yeah. The language has not been standardized. And so it does make for kind of a confusing conversation from time to time. But neurodiversity is a di diversity of minds together in a group. Right, exactly. And I like that you brought up the terminology piece because it can be confusing. So some people like neurodiversity, some people like neurodivergence, some people like, which is also, uh, by the way, a an appropriate term. It's not one that is preferred by all people. Some people do find it offensive, but it is um, medically appropriate and scientifically appropriate um, as as is currently used. So I just want to, I just want to clarify that. Um and I'm and I and I've seen all kinds of different terms. And also there are people who don't want to be called autistic or don't want to be called bipolar or don't want to be called dyslexic. They want to say, I have autism, I have bipolar, I have dyslexia, because it's a distinction of it doesn't define me. It's just this thing that I have over here. So that's kind of been an interesting thing. What are what are kind of your thoughts about the um, ownership of, of a diagnosis? I want to respect however another person perceives themselves 
and how they want to describe themselves. So I try very hard to be sensitive to that. It's to me, it's the same as pronouns, right? How do you want to be addressed? I want to be respectful of who you are and, and treat you in that way. Um, for me personally, my diagnosis is so much a part of my personality and who I am. It explains everything about me, um, good <laughs> and not so good. So um, I don't take offense either way personally. Okay. Well, cool. That, and thank you for sharing. And that was a good point about it just, you know, if somebody prefers it to be said a certain way, great. And, and it's okay, by the way, folks, um, everyone I've at least interacted with, and I'm sure that there are exceptions to this in this community of neurodivergence or neurodiversity is okay. If you get it a little wrong the first time, it's just kind of, once we've told you a few times, then you should probably be getting it right at that point, because everybody does have different preferences. You know, it's, it's okay. If you fumble it a little bit, that's all right. Um, but it's just a matter of you know, once you've been told then don't keep repeating the same offense. Um, and I know it's, I know it's hard and I want to give space. I want to give empathy for that, by the way, because I understand, trust me with the work that I do, that it can be, it can seem overwhelming right? To have all these different preferences and all of that coming your way. Mm -hmm. But it's really not that hard once you kind of get into it. You kind of get used to it. You kind of just have to adjust how you think. So the first thing I want to talk about, Jen, is uh, so we kind of talked about what it is, right? So when it comes to work, there's this misconception, as I like to call it. It's my nicest word for it, where <laughs> people think that folks with neurodiversity, neurodivergence, mental health diagnoses are less than or have problems or are going to be an issue or are just going to be way more work than what they're worth. So what are your thoughts on that topic? Well, it's absolutely untrue. Um, I work in the email marketing industry and it is an unusual specialty. Uh, it's very niche and it's a very tight knit community. And when I got my diagnosis and I, I thought about the, the people that I know in the industry and the similarities that they have to me and the way in which one falls into email marketing, it's not considered a sexy career. You just kind of get thrown into it because you have the potential to solve problems a certain way. And um, nobody chooses it. Nobody's like, oh, I'm going to go to email marketing school and pursue this email marketing career <laughs> in the way that people will pursue other digital channels. And so we're kind of a, a community of like misfits and weirdos who are have bonded. And I, and I wondered, like, I just wondered if maybe there was a higher rate of neurodivergence in my industry as compared to other industries. So I put the word out to my network and I started interviewing people who were willing to speak to me about being neurodivergent in the email industry. Now, I don't have any kind of data points to, to prove whether or not this higher incidence is correct. But once I started talking about it more and more and more, of my peers started saying, me too, me too, me too. Right? And in the interviews that I did, I asked, uh, the last question I asked every single person was, if you could uh, undo this, um, this diagnosis, if you could be neurotypical, would you? 100% of them said, no. I Isn't like that who interesting. I am. I like who I am and, and, um, I'm proud of who I am and this is me. And right. additionally, 100% of them said that they felt that their neurodivergence gave them certain professional, um, talents. And I want to, I want to hit on that because there is science behind that. So that's not just opinion based. I want to throw that out there. So multiple studies have been done um, all the way from Harvard to Drexel to uh, Yale, the psychology today published another one. There are a whole bunch of studies out there that actually show that the difference, um, um, I don't know how to say it, like diagnoses or however you want to say it, the different, the different manifestations of neuro of uh, diversity or divergence all do come with upsides, right? So yeah, you know, you may have to learn to read a different way, or you may have what I call my my floppies or my twitches, you know, or you or what Stacy Kesson calls my my dance moves, which I think is hysterical. Um, 
<laughs> and, or you may have these different things, or your manic and depression uh, cycles, but, but you're also going to be, you know, some, some of them, uh, some of the manifestations come with intense creativity, innovation, um, nonlinear thinking, ability to learn at hyperspeeds, ability to memorize. And I want to clarify that I'm not saying that you, it, I, I've gotten some people that have been confused about, about this. So I want to be clear about what I'm saying. I'm not saying that people are only worth their quote superpowers, right? Or that you should only hire someone because of their superpowers. But it is amazing. And it is something to consider that's out there, right? It is something to to be aware of that every good has a bad and vice versa, right? So it's just, it it does come and there is science behind the positive aspects of neurodiversity and divergence. So, and carrying that over into the workplace is interesting, right? Like it's a whole right. other, it's a whole other thing. So one thing that psychology today also talks about as well as some other great sources is that a mind is more productive and a person is more happy and healthy when they're allowed to work in a way that's natural to them, which for our community can be very interesting because you have people that need noise canceling headphones, people that need to bounce on yoga balls, people that need to have fidgets, people that need to present information in a presentation. You got one, don't you? Yep. <laughs> And a pre- I'm always pumping my, my, my little clips while I'm doing presentations. <laughs> I love that. I have different, I have all my, my stuff back there for the days that I need it. I need my sensory stuff. I have a little rabbit. I have a squishy thing. I have all kinds of stuff that I use. So I'm right there with you. Um, and so the, the mind is more healthy and people are more productive. So what are your, how do you achieve that? What are, what are some ways that you recommend achieving that in the workplace? Well, we need um, leadership that understands these issues and offers some flexibility. You know, in the past, the workplace was so formal and you everyone had to be very conformist to certain expectations. The world is changing at an incredible rate right now, right? This um, work from right. home trend and um, that is has its upsides and its downsides, but it, it, folks who are neurodivergent and they have that ability to work at home, they can create an environment that is a lot more comfortable for them. If I'm in the workplace, if I'm in an office, I'm overwhelmed by um, the ambient noise. I cannot focus. I'm uh, super social. I'm easily distracted by conversations and I literally cannot work in an open space um, at all. I have to, I mean, I I can have meetings, I can have conversations and I find that to be work that is productive, but I cannot sit at my desk and focus. I can't write copy. I can't conceive a strategy. I can't uh, design my presentation slides until everyone clears out of the office. And then there I am for two, three, four hours after hours. And that's not a great lifestyle. So, um, we we do need our our employers to understand that some folks have uh, they're very sensitive to their environments, or the, the lighting, the noise, their comfort, the people around them, um, the sense of you know some privacy to focus, and and start giving more flexibility. And we are seeing that, and not because it accommodates uh, the neurodivergent population, but because work from home is becoming our new reality. It is, which is kind of cool. I just want to throw that out there. I've been doing it since 2014 for the most part, and I freaking love it. I won't ever go back. I, it's the best thing in the world. But to your point, and, and all the needs are different, right? I love that you threw out different needs that people may have. And it's, you have to, one of the things that I think a lot of times is missed when you become a leader is that people don't tell you that your job is taking care of people. Like somehow that gets missed. That like that very simple concept gets missed. And I actually just did a post about this, but I had a faux pas as a manager once of a um, a neurodiverse person who was ADHD. I did not know what to do with him. He he was so energetic and he had he was so brilliant and I knew how successful he'd been in previous roles. And it was very frustrating to me because I knew I had to be the one failing, but I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. 
and he, I just couldn't get him to focus. He wasn't learning things. And I, and I knew it was me. It was not on him. And so I asked his last manager, and this is when I got the best advice I ever got as a manager. He looked at me and he said, did you ask him what he needed? Did you ask him what he needed? A doy. Like, why didn't that like, come into my head, right? Like, why had that not been the first thing that I did? So, and then, by the way, it got exponentially better. He rocketed to success and is now a wonderful recruiter. And that's when I learned, you know, you sometimes you have to go, okay, you know, it's not about me or what I think or what I know or what I, you tell me, what do you need? And it was so simple, by the way, it was not complicated. It wasn't an inconvenience for me or anything. You know, it, it was just doing something a little bit different for somebody on my team who then was a massive success. So, you know, I always kind of come back to, and, and we did have a comment um, from, from Laura about, you know, not wanting to use the term disorder anymore. And I understand that because I do think it gives a very negative connotation to it. And, and it's not necessarily a negative thing. Like for instance, with this particular person, his ADHD was great. There was nothing wrong with him. I do. We just needed to teach him a little bit differently and, and function a little bit differently. Hewlett Packard has a great program where they let everybody be themselves and it's been highly, highly successful. So how do you, why do you, first of all, why do you think this isn't so common? And second of all, how would you propose fixing it? There's just, there's a lack of awareness. There are very few DEI programs that are giving consideration to neurodiversity right now. And what complicates it further is that it's inappropriate to ask people if they have a diagnosis. And it is terrifying to disclose if you have a diagnosis because there could be risks associated with that could be perceived negatively and problematic, and it could potentially compromise your employment. So um, the solution is, is education, right? Leaders need to understand that there is a significant chunk of your employees that are different from the rest, and maybe you couldn't quite put your finger on it before, and this is likely the reason. But um, if you are uh, treating everyone with empathy and the assumption that this is a possibility and that you will accommodate any request and you create an environment where it's safe to speak up and ask for accommodations and that you don't have to disclose and that even folks who are not diagnosed because there are a lot of undiagnosed people out there who oh my may, gosh, yes. may be aware and may think that they are neurodivergent or may not know at all. Right? I've run and, into those people where it's like, am I, do I need to tell them? Like, cause somebody needs to, <laughs> like you right? really should know this about yourself. It's a good thing. <laughs> and it was, uh, I, I had that conversation with someone. Um, I, I had a late in life diagnosis and I disclosed it to a friend and he was like, you didn't know that? Yeah, me too. <laughs> like, like, duh. This is why we do a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, but like a, a culture where it, it, it is safe to speak up and ask for help. Um, and, you know, before my diagnosis, I, I was having some struggles and I did ask for help and I was denied the accommodations that I needed. And uh, the things that I struggle with and probably that Everyone who has a, a genuine workplace struggle that is tied to neurodivergence, it's not the job that you're hired to do that you truly struggle with. It's the other stuff. It's, yes. For, for me, it was the boring administrative tasks. I was not hired to do expense reports. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they are so <laughs> difficult for me to do. Um, uh, dealing with deadlines is difficult for me. Um, I like working meetings. I like to sit down and make things happen while we're all together in a room. I don't want to talk about it and then do it later. Uh, it kind of like it, my flow just- I've it's heard that a lot flowing. before. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that a lot before from people. So when you're talking about, so, so you hit on, and one of the number one kind of objections that I hear from businesses when it comes to neurodiversity and neurodivergence and embracing them is 
is the deadline issue is people will go, but like realistically, sometimes there's deadlines. And what's funny to me is they think that when you say deadlines are difficult for me, that you're asking them to not have business deadlines, <laughs> but that's not it. <laughs> that's not what's being said. So, so just for clarification, what would be a solution that you would see for the deadline issue? That is a very good question. <laughs> there no I try. Answers. Thank you. <laughs> um, for some reason, my productivity is highest when the crushing weight of failure is on my shoulders. Oh. <laughs> so if you give me a month to do something, I'm going to do it on day 30 and I'm going to work 12 <laughs> consecutive hours on it. And I have not solved that problem. I'm not really sure how to deal with that. Um, I'm not an expert in neurodiversity. I like that honesty. Thank you. I'm just a person <laughs> who is struggling in the world along with everyone else. And I want to hit on that too. So I think it's great as a leader to ask someone, do you have a solution for this? But don't put the entire burden on them either. Maybe, and maybe you take time together. Yes. Thank you, Laura. Collaboration and communication. That is exactly where I was going with this work together to find a solution. I've done this with multiple team members over the years where, for instance, I have a team member who, or had, I guess she, she uh, has moved on to have her own business and career. And I'm super proud of her, but who had a, uh, a traumatic brain injury. And so we would have to sometimes find solutions for things like deadlines or things like uh, detail, the way details were presented. And it was just about working together. And it was not that hard, by the way, like people act like this is just some like hours and hours of time consuming. And it's really not. <laughs> it's just as simple as a few conversations where you work together and go, okay, you know, this worked, this didn't, let's see where we go from there. And folks, that's part of business. And that's part of leadership. It just is the job. And ultimately, this kind of thing can even apply to other folks, you know, like the neurotypical folks. What if it's something going on in their personal lives where they need some adjustments? What if they're having a short-term mental health concern? Which, by the way, at any given time, I found this very interesting. Approximately 50% uh, of people at some point will have a serious, although sometimes temporary, mental health concern. You said 50% 50 of the population at, yeah. at some point in their life will have a serious mental health concern, whether it's short term or long or a long term diagnosis. So think about that. 50% of the people in this world will at some point experience this. So you're going to have to be good at dealing with this. And about 30% of the population is neurodiverse, neurodivergent, however you want to say it. So you have all these folks floating around who at some point are going to need some help with this. So get good at collaboration and communication. <laughs> it works. It works. Uh, and by the way, one of the ones I used for the deadline issue, just throwing this out there, I don't know if this will work for you, is a calendaring the steps of the projects, having her actually calendar time to work each step. Uh, this is what worked for her. And then another one was uh, more flexible deadlines. So, so be me being realistic, because sometimes I would give deadlines and I'm going, okay, yeah, that wasn't actually really when I needed that. I don't know why I'm so specific about that. So sometimes it wasn't things that actually needed deadlines. It's just, it needed to be, we needed to be sure that it was being maintained in general. So then we didn't make it a deadline thing. It was just, Hey, just make sure that this is taken care of. So some of it was being more realistic on my standpoint too. And I'm a big control freak. That's part of my <laughs> <laughs> I just did a post that says, I'm not bossy. I'm just aggressively helpful. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Something that helps me is, is co-working, right? Like just being together, uh, even virtually live and, you know, getting the ball rolling on something collaboratively together. You know, you could be sitting at a table in a conference room. You can be um, on a Zoom. But as long as I have someone with me, that can get me going. Um, and then I can yes. continue that momentum. Uh, and also having someone there with you, uh, if they are collaborating with you, like in real time, you can be solving problems instead of slacking each other. Slack is a constant interruption and it, 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 it's 
will wreck my flow completely. Like all <laughs> these different distractions are coming at us nonstop. Um, but if I can uh, turn off all notifications and just be with one or more other people, physically or virtually, to collaboratively get something started, then I start making amazing progress that way. I love that. That's cool. See, that collaboration and communication. There you go. Laura hit it on the head with that. She really did. She nailed that. There's a trend now, like an anti-meeting trend. Yes, right? I know. There are companies that are trying to ban meetings and they're like, you just need to make little videos uh, for your colleagues to bring the, to give them status updates on things and that they can watch at their leisure. Well, if you send me status updates via you know little videos, um, what I do is I leave them on red in my unread in my inbox to remind me to watch them at a future time that never happens. happens. No. And, and contrary to that. So my, uh, my husband who is, is a brilliant human being and is on the spectrum, he can't stand meetings. There's like, there's just like no point to that for him. And it's, it's rarely productive and it's very frustrating for him. And I know several people who have autism or who have other variances as well, that that's the same thing where it's very, very frustrating for them. So they're again, just different preferences. So for you, you need them for him. He doesn't. And so that's why one thing I've been consulting a lot of companies on with when it comes to neurodiversity is having multiple options for everything. I, I have this, uh, this kind of saying of make accommodation standard. So present information in multiple ways and even just down to different learning styles, this makes sense, right? So people that learn auditory, kinetic, visual, present the information in different ways so that people process it the most effectively. And we had a question about statistics, and I don't know specifically what statistics they were looking for, but yes, I have stats for everything. Um, so like with Hewlett Packard, um, so their program that I talked about that has the, uh, that's specifically geared to let everybody work in a way that makes them comfortable, that program yielded 30% higher results than the rest of their, the rest of their corresponding teams, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, and there are plenty and plenty of stats out there. So whatever it was that you're asking about specifically, uh, feel free to post it or feel free to message me and I will, I will respond. And we also had a question about a list. Is, is there a list um, of companies that embrace you know, the different working styles and, and neurodiversity and all that. There's not a like formal list in existence, but there are different sources and I've personally compiled quite a few. So Deborah, if you want to message me, I'd be happy to share that. A few of them are JP Morgan Chase, Hewlett Packard. Uh, there's a company that I work with called Synchro. They specifically have a have a program for that. There are multiple large companies that do, but contact me. I'd be glad to send you the list that I do have. Um, it is it is actually more extensive than you might think, and it is an ever growing concept. And some of these big organizations figured it out kind of quick, which I'm pretty proud of because usually big organizations are like way behind and like so backward from <laughs> everything. But with neurodiversity, they've kind of grabbed hold and run. Because it, the value of neurodiversity is the same as the value of any kind of diversity. When you have so many different perspectives, then you have a superpower team that can solve problems in new and innovative ways. If everyone has the same background and the same education and the same socioeconomic upbringing, then they're not going to bring a lot of different points of view to solving business problems and achieving yes. objectives. So um, when you this idea of the value of diversity has become very common and widespread when it comes to uh, racial diversity, socioeconomic diversity, LGBT. TQ diversity, um, all of those marginalized groups, we now understand like, oh, we, we want those different perspectives because it actually has a positive impact on the bottom line. Yes, it does. If, if the culture allows for people to be safe and comfortable to speak up and collaborate yes. in that way. Boston you, Consulting Group, real quick, because people want stats. I'm just going to throw this out there. So Boston Consulting Group did a study on this. And when this is allowed, you get an average of 19% higher revenue when people are allowed to function in a way that's comfortable for them and when true diversity is embraced. Uh, embraced. So excuse me, Jen, keep going. So if we think of neurodiversity in exactly the same way, it's just one more category of diversity. And some of us are some weirdo thinkers, like we'll come up with some <laughs> out of the box ideas that maybe are not you know, viable, but 
they get the wheels churning. And so then when you bring all the brains together to solve the problems, right, that, that strange out of the box, completely different point of view um, might be amazing and perfect, or it might be yes. a catalyst for, for um, the rest of the group to kind of latch onto and refine. So absolutely. Um, Yes, having a diversity of brains is a beautiful thing and it, <laughs> it is, is good for business as well as being the right thing to do. And right. your neurodivergent employees often are uh, your most passionate. It, it kind of comes naturally to That's uh, true, actually. With certain diagnoses. Uh, they care about their work and they care about people and, and they're high quality humans that you want on your team who can contribute so much. It's true. And, and I want to kind of touch on that, you know, we've, we've, we talked about how people do contribute and it's factual. I mean, there's just endless, there's just study after study after study to show that this works and to show that, you know, these, um, that these, comp that these groups really are, you know, so much more productive. And like I said, like psychology today, as well as multiple other institutions, releasing studies about how everybody works better when they're allowed to, to behave in a natural way to how their brain processes information. It's very, very, um, very, very interesting to watch. And I've watched it. I've, I've done that with my own team. I tell everybody, Hey, whatever you need, do it, do your thing. I don't care. As long as the work gets done, however, I can support you. You tell me, and that's from equipment, you know, what equipment do you need, um, all the way to how their style of work, their style of how they want information presented. It's really not that hard folks, but kind of the last thing I want to talk about is, is it the advocacy aspect? So yes, companies do need to get it together and they do need to listen and they do need to be accommodating and understanding that diversity is not just about race and gender. Seems to be a mass amount of confusion around that subject. It's about so many more things than that. But then the personal advocacy of being able to hold up your hand and I know it's scary folks, okay? I get it from a very personal standpoint. I understand that it's hard to present this information. For me, it's a pride issue. I don't want people to see me as weak. And for some people, it's a fear issue. They're scared that they're going to lose their job or they're scared of losing respect or they're scared of oppor losing opportunity. And it's a very real fear. I am not discrediting that fear. There are so many companies out there that are backward. But if you advocate for yourself and do it in a way with a positive spin, kind of like we're talking about here, we're talking about our neurodiversity, but in a very positive way. Sometimes it's how you present the information that can be helpful. Like, you know, go to your boss and say, hey, it would be really helpful for me if I had this, you know, it's made it very difficult to not have this because X, Y, Z. So if I had it, I would be able to be a lot more productive, things like that. And just kind of talk about it that way. And also if your company's not neurodivergence or neurodiversity inclusive. First of all, you can call me. I'll be glad to talk to them and help them out. It's usually not that hard once somebody tells them, honestly. But just talk to them about what that is. Send them an article. Go, hey, you know what? I found this article about neurodiversity and leadership, and I thought it would be a really cool read for you. And just send it to them and see what they say. And however, they, and then after they respond to that, then maybe that can be a good dialogue starter. What are some ways, Jen, that you would recommend being an advocate for yourself? Again, I do not have the answers. Um, I would be, I still would be afraid in the workplace, depending on my workplace. If my workplace has not addressed neurodiversity at all in their DEI efforts, I would be intimidated to reveal. Of course. I would be subtle in asking for my accommodations. Um, if you do not have fear of losing your job, you can be uh, a lot more uh, vocal. Um, in a worst case scenario, you can always consult with an employment attorney, right? If your accommodations are that not gets real bad. extreme, real fast. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, these things never go to court, but a strongly written letter often <laughs> results in some action one it's way true. or another. And you um, could go to Legal Shield for that, by the way, and they will do it very cheap for you. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, you just, and often you just have to do a Google sh search for like, what is an employment attorney in my state who, who can advise me? Um, and I think that uh, people who are dealing with challenges in the workplace hesitate to seek legal counsel uh, when it yes. is appropriate. And I am litigious AF. So I got 
It's <laughs> <laughs> agile for everything, not just problematic issues, but like, um, please review this job offer and let me know. Right. If there's anything this right. Just possible. common sense type mm -hmm. stuff as well. And, and just common business practice. So a, it can be very smart just to have somebody there for that. Um, and I will also say though, with the self advocation, it can, I know it can be scary. Right. Um, and I'm kind of a, like, I just don't care. I'm just going to tell you what I need and do it or don't. And we'll deal with it accordingly. That's my personality. That's not for everybody. And it is very scary, but I would say starting by educating them about neurodiversity, um, send it my way. And if you have a question, I want to throw this out there. I have information to give you that works. I am telling you, I've gotten this down. I've gotten it to where I can get a company to at least go, okay, let it, let's hear about this. Let's talk about this. We can, I will help you work through it. I'm very, very happy to do that. I'm happy to talk to your company about neurodiversity and what's going on and kind of help them to understand because a lot of people just don't know. They really honestly do not know that this is a thing that needs to be considered. So um, I know we kind of need to wrap up the show. We've gone way over, which is great. Um, <laughs> but I want to, I want to thank you so very much um, for, for reaching, for coming on today and talking to us about this, because it is frustrating because it's not a type of diversity that's talked about a whole lot. It's gaining traction, but I will tell you folks that the uplifting thing is that whenever I have spoken to a group of HR folks, managers, um, executives, that people, once they understand it, are a lot more open to it, even more so than with other types of diversities, frankly, which is sad, but true. But it's nice for us, right? <laughs> that it, it seems to be something that people can relate to and understand. So that's the good news is that we're getting there. And it's not every company and it's frustrating and it's dumb. And sometimes it just makes you want to scream. And you can reach out to me for that too, because I get it. But, <laughs> but the, in the meantime, um, educate, teach people, talk about neurodiversity in general. It doesn't have to be related to yourself. Talk to people about it in general and teach them. Correct them if they say something dumb. I know a child who does that. It's so cute. He's on the autism spectrum and he'll just tell you, oh no, that's incorrect. What's actually true is blah, 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 blah. And it's wonderful. So so be like TJ. He's a great little kid. Be, <laughs> be like him. <laughs> um, and thank you again, Jen. What are your final words for us? Um talking about neurodiversity, it, sometimes it's just as simple as, as just a subtle suggestion, right? If your company's not addressing it and there's some kind of diversity conversation going on, that is an opportunity to say, hey, um, what about neurodiversity? You know, my my nephew, he's on the autism spectrum or uh, my my dear friend has ADHD and, you know, right. I'm hearing how their workplace is accommodating that. What about us? Uh, I recently had the opportunity to speak at a diversity event for one of my client companies. It's, it's called Influence. And I pulled some sound bites from my new podcast. It's, it's called Humans of Email. And um, uh, one of the sound bites was from an individual in my industry who's very beloved and prominent, who is dyslexic. And he explained how his dyslexia uh, was an advantage for him professionally. I played the sound bite and I talked about neurodiversity in the workplace. And they, they were so um, appreciative. That was this was new information right. for them, right? And something that they hadn't thought of yet. And they were like really interested in finding out more. And I connected you with them, as a matter of fact, immediately after because they were like, "Hey, we we it's just not on our radar." Like, thank you. Like, we want to dive into this. So, simply introducing the conversation can be very powerful. I've lost.